Kamaoka no hikironga i arangi toto, tahuri ake koe te moana ki wai te mata, ka uto waka ki ora ake iri ora ora ake mata tanifa. Takahi e koe te one ki o kahu, dere te koto haere ki te tai o te uru ko maunga ki e ki e tu noana, tu ke monga fau te taha fakararo. Ka heke ka piki ki runga no i te mata o te na fe noa, ko wai papa te marae, ko wai papa te tau ranga waka. Ko wai papa tau matarau. Ka piki anō ki te rō ngā whenua ara te pae mau ngō rangi puke e whātare tare mai neki a mātou ko ngā wai o horu tiu te marae, ko ngā wai o horu tiu te awa e rere nei e tere tonu nei. Nei rā mātou e noho nei i raru te tua nui o tēnei o ngā whare ara ko te pūrengi e whātolo toro ana ngā ringa mana hau mata kui kui pōwhiri ki tēnā ki tēnā o koutou e kia nei te kōrero nau mai Haere mai, pakatau mai rā. Haere mai rā ki runga no i tēnei whenua, o te rā me te mana whenua ngā ti whātua rākei. Haere mai rā ki runga no i tēnei whare wānanga, a rā ko te wānanga aro no i o tāma ki makaurau AUT e mehi nei e tangi nei ki a koutu katoa. Nō rira aha koa koei, aha koa nōhia, e tātou mā, piki mai, kake mai, nau mai, haere mai tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, Nei rā mātou kā mihi, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, APEC 2021 has been an extraordinary journey, delivered in extraordinary times. With the challenges that our economies face, we are firm believers that more than ever, collaboration is required to succeed. This has been our theme for the year. Join work, grow together. Haumie, huie, taikie. These words describe the collaborative effort our ancestors drew on as they worked together to build our great ocean voyaging vessels called waka. Building a waka required entire communities to work in harmony toward a common goal. Whilst their goal was to build a waka, ours is to rebuild from the worst pandemic we've known. More than ever, working together is required. That same idea of together is expressed in our tōpū, or symbol for APEC 2021. Our tōpū draws on the concept of ngā hauwe whā, which translates to the four winds. The wind from the north, known as hauraki. The wind from the west, we call hauāuru. And from the east is marangai. The wind from the south, we call hautonga. The four winds, all from different directions, come together. Ngā hauwhaa is symbolic of being a meeting place for all peoples, from everywhere, to be unified, to be together, to be connected. For APEC 2021, we welcome our colleagues from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west, to join, work, grow. And so our tohu is a form of welcome as we metaphorically journey from different parts of the Pacific to meet, to be together. Join, work, grow together. Homie huie taiki. Ina mana, ina reo, i rau ranga tera mā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora everybody and welcome back to the second day of our APEC Voices of the Future main event. I'm Tim McCready, your MC today, and it's great to be back with you. I hope you found that explanation of our symbol and slogan for APEC 2021 interesting. Like APEC, we take our inspiration for Voices of the Future 2021 from the meeting of the four winds and the importance of collaboration as we move forward together. Today, we have two further sessions reflecting the themes of the event, a greener future and a future for all. We will be concluding the event with a presentation of the Youth Declaration to New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, followed by an interactive session with her. Along the way, we also have the opportunity to hear from delegates and to view some of the wonderful video content that we've already seen produced for us. 
But to start, we have a, have a video message from the UN Secretary General's Envoy for Youth, Jayathma Vikramanayaka, who was appointed to this role in 2017 at the age of 26. She works to expand the UN's youth engagement and advocacy efforts in areas such as sustainable development, human rights, peace and security and humanitarian action, and also serves as a representative of the Secretary General. Let's hear from Jayathma. Hello everyone, my name is Jayathma Vikramanayake and I am the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. And it's my pleasure to join all of you today at APEC Voices of the Future 2021. Thank you very much to the organizers, APEC, for having me here today. And thank you to the government of New Zealand for hosting this important event to support young people in the Asia Pacific region to share their unique perspectives in front of APEC leaders. As many of you are already aware, the world's generation of young people is the largest generation that the world has ever seen. Moreover, here in the Asia-Pacific region where I come from, nearly 1 billion young people are the region's biggest potential of change makers. However, like many young people from around the world, youth in the Asia-Pacific region faces the risk of uncertain futures due to the complication of multidimensional crises. The irreversible impacts of the climate crisis has significantly impacted the lives of young people, especially those who live in small island communities that face an increased risk of losing their homes. COVID-19 pandemic has not only impacted young people's mental health, but also the prospect of their education where 572 million students were impacted by school closures. This staggering number only amplified due to the fact that there are still 2.2 billion children and young people aged 25 or younger who do not have an internet connection at home, making educational access even more difficult and proving the need to close our world's digital divide. Not only that, COVID-19 has also severely impacted young people's career building opportunities. In 2020 alone, youth employment fell by 8.7% compared to 37 for adults. Despite the different challenges that young people are facing from all fronts and all aspects of their lives, it is important to note that young people are also one of the most resilient agents of change. From time to time, young people have continuously proved their persistency in advocating for a better future that they truly deserve. Taking the clear example of the climate movement, young people have been not only consistent but also fearless in holding the world's leaders accountable for their actions and inaction in responding to the climate crisis. At the height of the pandemic last year, young people stepped onto the front lines and brought their innovative solutions to deliver immediate responses, despite often lacking resources and support. Today, as the world struggles with limited mobility due to the impact of the pandemic and digitalization becomes more relevant, young entrepreneurs around the world are utilizing technology to bring the digital economy to their communities, even to rural and indigenous communities furthest away. With that, I want to highlight the relevance of young people's role and their leadership, especially at this time. The United Nations truly believe that young people are equal partners and that they must be meaningfully engaged if we are serious and committed to achieving the sustainable development goals as well as the agenda to recover better together. That being said, young people cannot do it on their own and they should not have to. The intergenerational partnership is key to supporting young people as it offers the possibility to help young people leverage from the experience, opportunities and resources from older generations who often sit at decision-making tables. When the UN Youth Strategy launched three years ago, it aimed to ensure the UN can be a leading institution that helps facilitate this intergenerational partnership and dialogue at all levels, and also help to guide the UN system to improve our work with and for young people. To do this, my office, along with the support and partnership from across the United Nations system, has been mobilizing the strategy's implementation and keeping this institution accountable. 
Earlier this year, we launched our first ever progress report and from there we learned that here in Asia Pacific, good progress to engage young people have already started. 80% of the UN country teams in this region have reported that young people are included in their actions on COVID-19 response and recovery with investments for youth-led solutions at 85% as one of the top areas supported. However, we need to ensure that this number can be translated into real impact on the ground in the region. And to do so, we would need strong international cooperation and support from decision makers at national and regional levels. We can't solve the world's biggest challenges, whether in addressing the climate crisis, global pandemic, digital divide, unemployment and missed education without the active participation of young people, as these are the concerns that they have to face in navigating their present and their future. Clearly, when we are thinking of rebuilding the future for our people and our planet, we need to ensure that these challenges are addressed and the concerns of the world's largest generation who will inherit the future are taken into account. This is why the four themes of discussion at APEC 2021, Voices of the Future Addresses, are both timely and important. From discussing the international cooperation to combat COVID-19, discussing the status of our digital future while ensuring that it is also a green future to look forward to, and most importantly, discussing the need to build a future for all, will give APEC leaders the opportunity to hear directly from young leaders in this region on exact actions and support that they require and that they hope to see from decision makers. I'm very much looking forward to today's presentation of the Youth Declaration by the young leaders and change makers who have led this process. I want to stress the importance of ensuring that young people have the space and agency to speak on their behalf, most importantly, to speak in their position as equal partners in building a shared future together. It's my big hope today that the outcome of the Youth Declaration will be taken into consideration by the leaders and policymakers in the room and could be a start of intergenerational collaboration, partnership and dialogue in the Asia-Pacific region for years to come. Thank you, Jayathma, for that powerful message which goes right to the heart of what Voices of the Future seeks to achieve. Now we come to our keynote speaker for today, Wayne Hay. And if you watch Al Jazeera, you may know Wayne already as, has, as he has been Al Jazeera's correspondent in Asia for many years and has more recently been reporting for Al Jazeera here in New Zealand. Wayne is also a graduate of our university partner, Auckland University of Technology, where I am today. Wayne will be talking about the big picture of politics and economics in the APEC region. And there will be an opportunity following his address for comments and questions. Please welcome Wayne Hay. Thank you, Tim, uh, and hi, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it is uh, truly an honor, uh, and I'm humbled to be asked to speak at this Voices of the Future Youth Conference, and uh, thank you to the AUT as well for hosting this incredible event, uh, one that uh, I know a lot of people have put a lot of hard work into having, despite the challenges posed by uh, this pandemic that we're all facing around the world. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I did study at uh, AUT many, many years ago, very briefly. I studied business and tourism before I took a huge detour to get into the media industry. Uh, and it's a detour that I'm uh, still on today. Um, I'm yet to complete those studies at AUT, but hopefully I, I will one day. But my career in uh, media and journalism has been a great journey and one that continues today. I guess I was asked to speak uh, at this conference because I'm a bit different to uh, many of the other voices that you'll hear. I'm not a politician, clearly. I'm, I'm not an academic, and I'm, I'm not an expert on the issues that you've come together to discuss. But what I can bring, I think, to the discussion is time on the front line, as it were, seeing and speaking to the people who are directly affected by the decision makers of the world. And certainly the youth delegates uh, are among the decision makers of the world today and in the future. So my job for Al Jazeera was Asia correspondent based first in Kuala Lumpur, then in Bangkok. And now, as Tim mentioned, I'm freelancing from back here in New Zealand. And I think for a reporter being based in the Asia Pacific region is absolutely the best patch you could wish for. It is dynamic. It's varied. Uh, it's evolving and developing in some cases, it's regressing, 
Uh, it's turbulent, it's chaotic, it's organized. It has absolutely everything. And that's why I think it's truly fascinating. And, uh, and I enjoy every minute uh, when I am reporting in the field in the Asia Pacific region. So in my job, not only have I had uh, many cushy assignments covering events like APEC, ASEAN summits, the World Economic Forum, where you get to sit around in air conditioned uh, comfort enjoying the catering, but I've also got my hands dirty week in, week out, covering the issues on the ground that are discussed in those conference centers uh, and boardrooms. So one week I might be covering those meetings in one particular country of some of the world's most powerful uh, people. Uh, the next, I might be being chased around the streets by secret police in another country, sometimes managing to avoid those security forces, sometimes not so successful. It's unfortunate, of course, that those situations arise uh, and they can be uh, scary, daunting uh, when they occur, but there's a personal and professional sense of satisfaction in a way because I know I'm doing my job when those situations occur, attempting to shine a light where someone or an organization or a government doesn't want that light shone. And that's something I think we should all strive for, not just those in the media, to not always accept things at face value, but to dig a little deeper, to get the answers we deserve uh, and to demand transparency. So getting out there with the people is part of the job that I love the most. It's something that many of our leaders, perhaps in politics or business, probably don't do often enough or don't have the opportunity to do often enough, which is ironic when you think about it, given that the decisions that they make influence uh, all of us around the world. You know, I interviewed a former prime minister once of a particular country who had had his legal troubles, those legal troubles are still going on. Uh, he had a lot of money seized by the courts as part of that legal trouble, rightly or wrongly. But he complained to me when I met him that because of the court's actions, he was only worth $1 billion now. Now, I'd be annoyed, as I'm sure many of us would be, if the courts took any of our money, money let alone millions, if not billions of dollars, but saying that publicly and expecting people to relate to it probably demonstrated how out of touch some of our leaders around the world can be. I think one of the issues that's always fascinated me and it's uh, dominated my work in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, is the issue that is one of the main themes of this year's conference and that is a future for all. And I, I thank you very much for including that as one of the main uh, themes. To me, that means inclusivity. It means people not being left behind when there is rapid change or growth. And it means equality. Now I know that word gets thrown around probably far too often, so much so that it loses its meaning to an extent. Uh, and to many people, it may be an unattainable dream, but it's something I believe that equality, we should never stop striving for that. And in my view, it, it doesn't mean everyone has the same things or the same amount of money, but it means that everyone has a chance. It means uh, everyone starts with the same opportunities. And that, of course, begins with education. Everyone deserves, in my opinion, the right to have a quality education. It should never be about who has the right connections or who has the right amount of money to get that quality head start in life. And to me, it also means to an extent political equality. It means people being able to have a voice. It means having a free press, something I've been on the wrong end of having been jailed for doing my job in a country that didn't believe in having a free press. And right now to this day, I do have colleagues who are behind bars for simply doing their job. I've seen people uh, in the course of my job in the worst situations imaginable as well, whether it be having lost their entire families and natural disasters or through political persecution or violence. And I've had to talk to people many times about their losses. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but while I'm there in that room interviewing those people, I certainly get emotional hearing their stories, but I'm always struck by their strength, even when faced with uh, seemingly overwhelming odds and situations that are completely out of their control. You can see the human spirit to fight and to not give up. And I, I think that should give us all encouragement, particularly during this very difficult time that we're all facing. And I would encourage uh, the youth delegates, uh, also governments and organizations through groupings like APEC to see what I see on a daily basis when I'm do doing my job, to not forget the individuals, because as you all know, we are not a planet made up of governments or companies or organizations. We're a planet made up of people. You know, when it comes to the economy, uh, Vietnam is a fascinating case study. It's a country I absolutely love and enjoy reporting from. In fact, the last APEC I covered was in 2017 in the city of Da Nang in Vietnam, when all the talk was about the signing of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that had been so long in the making. 
and the whole summit was dominated by the apparent clash of ideals between the US President Donald Trump, who of course came to power with the help of his America First policy, and he was not a fan of, of multilateral trade deals at the time, pulling the US out of the TPP and also of NAFTA. And on the other side at that time was China's President Xi Jinping, who was busy pushing the opposite message, that message that multilateralism was the way to go, particularly through the regional comprehensive economic partnership. So it was a particularly entertaining and fascinating APEC to cover. Now, I'm certainly not going to give you a history lesson about Vietnam, but it was, of course, ravaged by war. It has emerged to become an economic powerhouse, an incredible success story and was certainly looking to position itself as a viable alternative for manufacturing businesses, and still is, uh, that were getting caught up in that trade dispute between the United States and China. But even higher ups in the uh, Vietnamese government knew that with their economy, which was one of the best performing in the world, they had a big problem, and that was rising inequality. And that's something that we are seeing in many countries in the, around the world. Now, as a journalist, it's not easy getting to uh, speak to higher ups in any government, including in, in Vietnam. But on one occasion, when we went there, we did manage to get an interview with a senior economist who was an advisor to the government. And he highlighted corruption as one of the main problems that they had to tackle and that corruption was exacerbating the gap between rich and poor, uh, rich and poor, I should say. And tackling that corruption is something that we've seen uh, the Vietnamese government embark on very publicly in recent years. Now, inequality, as I say, is certainly not unique to a country like Vietnam. So the question is, how do we fight it? Uh, how do we ensure uh, that there is a future for all and people are not left behind? I have to say I'm a bit worried about the pandemic and the effect that it's going to have. Uh, we've seen some tremendous togetherness and unity in some regards, and I think, as other speakers have mentioned, that it is a real opportunity uh, to continue to grow cooperation between countries because we have all been affected by it and we all continue to be affected by it. The media industry that I am, of course, involved in has been profoundly affected by it. And I'm worried about what it could mean going forward for the media industry. If I think about international broadcast media coverage of Asia in particular, because of budget cuts and the changing media landscape, it had shrunk a lot before the pandemic in terms of people on the ground telling stories. Now, it's one thing that I'm immensely proud of Al Jazeera is that we continue to go into areas that others had long ago abandoned, particularly in Southeast Asia, in a country like Cambodia, for example. And now with the advent of Zoom and Skype interviews, which are, of course, completely free, I'm concerned that there's now another excuse for media companies not to send crews to places that may be a little bit out of reach to try to find stories firsthand, to see what's happening on the ground, because they can simply now do an interview remotely. But doing it that way is not going to be the same. And as I mentioned before, it's important for the world that the media is able to shine a light where sometimes people don't want that light uh, to be shone. Regarding the pandemic, more broadly speaking, there is going to be a mad scramble by everyone to make up for what's happened economically. And I think another question we have to pose is who's going to win from that? Will it be the small corner store owners who will be trying their best to earn as much money as they can now? Or will it be the corporate owned mega stores that can launch their big marketing campaigns, slashing their prices, doing big discounted deals uh, with their suppliers and manufacturers? So I think that is really something that we're going to have to watch going forward. And again, that's nothing new, but I'm worried that we're going to see things get worse as we emerge uh, from this pandemic. And then you factor in, of course, that the governments also have to start making some money to replace the trillions that have been spent helping their citizens and their businesses. Something has to give. And I just hope that the, it's the people that I've dealt with day in, day out in the far-flung villages of countries like Thailand, Myanmar, uh, China, I hope they're not the ones on the receiving end, and I hope that they are not left behind more than they sometimes are already. But in the delegates uh, gathered for this Voices of the Future conference, they do have a tremendous amount of hope, I believe. You are their voice. So I would encourage you to speak loudly and proudly for them and force governments to remember why they're there, to work for the people. So thank you very much for having me again. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, I look forward to your questions. 
Great. Thanks so much, Wayne, for that incredibly uh, honest address, which I think touches on so many of the themes that our delegates have been working through over the past few weeks. Uh, we do have questions, and just to let you know how this works, we're going to go to uh, the following economies in this order, Malaysia, New Zealand, Japan, and then Canada. So we will begin with Malaysia, if the delegate there is ready with their question. Hi there, and also good morning uh, from Malaysia and well. hi there, Wayne. Thank you very much for your uh, on a few things, especially the regional review. Yeah, I got two questions pertaining to uh, one is pertaining to APAC, the other is pertaining to youth and press freedom. So I'll go with the APAC one first. Um, so you're quite different from politicians itself. Uh, what are the barriers that could be that could impede uh, APAC vision, APAC project vision 2040? And the second question goes to how can youth itself be a medium for countries who do not accept press freedom, the push for press, press freedom agenda in the, in the specific countries? Yeah, uh, that's for me. Thank you very much. Well, I think the in terms of uh, barriers, um, the concern for that going forward within the APEC region is obviously protectionist policies. and. You know, I think that there is a concern because of what has happened with the pandemic that those sorts of policies could get uh, become more uh, prevalent, if you like. On one hand, as I mentioned, I think we've got a real opportunity here to encourage uh, a lot of the barriers to be broken down. And I know APEC has done a lot of hard work in this field. And a lot of success has been made as well and, and when it comes to things like uh, getting better access for the vaccines, getting better access for protective equipment, medical equipment to go into those countries that need it. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. And I think there is a real concern that uh, while there is that hope that uh, this is an opportunity and we need to embrace that opportunity right now, if we do not embrace that opportunity, I think the concern is that things could slide back the other way. So we could uh, regress even further into protectionist policies and to protect protectionist uh, practices, if you like. So I think that's really something that the, the countries need to be aware of. And I think the youth obviously have a big role to play in that and in, in demanding that some of those barriers get broken down. Uh, I think your, your second question, you broke up a little bit, but uh, was about the youth and the role to play when it comes to things like uh, press freedom, I think that is absolutely uh, fundamental. I think that they are uh, one of, if not the key players in this region when it comes to things like press freedom. And I think that term press freedom is another term that, that gets thrown around a lot and perhaps loses, loses a bit of its meaning because uh, press or media has changed so much in the last few years with the advent of social media, with online media, that the traditional foreign correspondent, perhaps job that I used to do in the field is gone to an extent, uh, or certainly has been uh, reduced and it's been replaced by citizen journalism and social media journalism and things like that, But which is fantastic. But at the same time, it has come with a certain level of uh, trust issues, shall we say. So people are now questioning the media perhaps more than they used to. Uh, because there is so much more of it out there. While some of the traditional traditional media has had to cut back because of budget issues and the changing landscape of the media industry, at the same time, there's been an explosion of media all around because of uh, online media and uh, social media journalism. So as I say, with that comes a, a concern uh, that people can't necessarily trust everything that they're reading and they're hearing. And we've seen a lot of that talked about fake news, et cetera. So I think the youth has a big role to play in promoting honest journalism, promoting outlets uh, that are trustworthy, that are reputable, that are well-known internationally. And these are the ones who can easily tell the stories, uh, perhaps in certain countries, where the domestic media may be under uh, some strict rules or more strict rules and they cannot speak as freely perhaps as someone from outside the country or perhaps foreign media representatives who are inside that country. So I think the youth has a huge role to play in ensuring that we've got that press freedom going forward because it's crucial, particularly as we enter this, you know, what could be a very turbulent period uh, post pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wayne and Malaysia, for that question. Uh, we've only got about three minutes left, so we'll see how we go here. But I'll pass to New Zealand next for a question from the New Zealand delegation. Kia ora. Thanks, Wayne, for that. Um, very informative. So our question is in regards to 
um, if you see anything in common um, with what has been successful. So you've kind of covered a whole number of things in the Asia Pacific where you've had um, ask for change, whether that be for climate justice or political change. So is there anything in common um, where there has actually been that change? If that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, it does. Kia ora, and thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I think the perhaps the, the thing in common, you know, I've covered a lot of stories about uh, the en environment, for example, environmental justice, as you mentioned, uh, and I think the common theme among all of those stories is individuals simply doing their own thing and really striving for change on the ground. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, fishermen in Thailand. You know, many people would look at fishermen and say, well, they're one of the biggest polluters because there are so many fishing nets and fishing lines and other rubbish that is thrown overboard from uh, fishing vessels when they're out there for so long but a part of the problem is there's no other option for them there's no education about well let's if you bring your stuff back to shore this is how it can be handled and this is what we'll do for you and so in Thailand there's many fishermen now who are recycling their used fishing nets and it's been helped along with a, a corporate of course and an NGO who are recycling those fishing nets uh, into other plastic products, uh, including PPE equipment, which is an amazing story and needs to be done more. But I think that's just one example of individuals on the ground. And I think that's the common theme. It's that individual spirit to really make a difference. Uh, yes, it has to be backed up more often than not with big corporations and governments and NGOs, but it starts with those people on the ground. And I really think that's the common theme. And without that, we, we wouldn't have any change. We wouldn't have any successes when it comes to things like trying to uh, fight climate change. Thank you very much for another great response. Unfortunately, uh, apologies to Japan and Canada. We're not gonna have time to get to, to those questions. I feel like we could carry this conversation on for quite some time. Uh, but thank you, Wayne, so much for sharing your, your comments with us, which I think has set the scene really well for the rest of today's events. We're now going to take a look at some more recorded content from you. Our delegates. In 2020, Vietnam was the only Southeast Asian country to register positive growth. However, the fourth wave pandemic in 2021 has badly hit the economy, in which the third quarter witnessed a 0.38% growth, the lowest since 2000. Vaccine inequality is one of our major concerns. Up to date, even though Vietnam has received large doses of vaccine through the COVAX initiative and donations from other countries, only 20% of the population has been fully vaccinated. This lack of access to vaccination has major consequences on Vietnam economy and its citizens' well-being. Children have to conduct online classes the industrial sector was hard in hit and its production in factories had to be pulled on hold. Xin chào, kia ora. We are the delegation from Vietnam. As the world is navigating through the COVID-19 pandemic, the Vietnam delegation places a strong emphasis on promoting youth inclusion and empowerment to make us more resilient to future crises. Better distribution plan focusing on developing and underdeveloped economies is much needed. In addition, each economy needs to proactively prioritize vaccination for vulnerable groups who are homeless, unemployed, or diagnosed with health conditions. We urge the APEC leader to facilitate the development of vaccination passport to ensure efficient flow of product in the exchange of human resource and ideas. This initiative will speak up economic recovery across the region and save the time effort and money for the government enterprise when quarantine restrictions are lessened. Another issue that we want to put forward is youth empowerment, which means young people will get involved more in decision-making processes of the region. The current issue is that Epic youngsters haven't had an official sharing network. We aim to develop more youth conferences with the attendance of policymakers, a platform where young people can voice their thoughts and join leaders in effecting changes throughout the region. Therefore, we propose the creation of an international organization called the APEC Youth Network. This organization will include virtual internships, networking events, and international conferences, which will foster a sense of solidarity among youngsters 
in the APEC region as well as come up with innovative solutions to global issues. We sincerely believe in the youth capability to make significant impacts in the post-COVID world. For that to happen, we hope to create an inclusive environment where vaccine access and quarantine restriction are no longer problems that hinder our development. We also aspire to create an interactive network of like-minded individuals in the Africa region. Together, we can make a change. Thank you, Vietnam, for that, uh, for that video. We now come to the first of our two thematic sessions for today, a greener future. As delegates from around the world meet in Glasgow for COP26, this is clearly a hugely topical issue. We all know about the challenges the planet faces from climate change, but as speakers in our drafting session also reminded us, there are other significant environmental challenges in terms of pollution and management of natural resources like the ocean and wildlife. Before we hear from our invited speakers, I would like to ask the lead drafters of the Green Future section of the Youth Declaration, Simona Oliveri from Chile and Tina Reina from Canada, to summarise the content of the declaration in the area of environment, sustainability and climate change. Please welcome both of you. Yes, we are living through a critical moment in time, a climate emergency. If we want to mitigate climate change impacts and build a greener future for all, we urge APEC leaders to adopt and carry that green. In addition, we know there are disadvantaged communities, such as ethnic minorities. We urge APEC leaders to encourage public-private sector cooperation, develop universal standards for carbon emission taxes, provide incentives for businesses to reduce carbon emissions and create a climate change adaptation and resilience fund to tackle climate change worst case scenario. Furthermore, we believe that research and development are crucial areas to ensure sustainability in a world where new developments and science are ever evolving. With an increasing innovation investment, we can shift away from unsustainable materials such as plastics and fuels. Our charge to APEC leaders is to research on carbon capture technology and establish an effective monitoring system to measure environmental social governance progress and to ensure collective accountability. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Simona and Tina, for that. It is now my pleasure to invite Kim de Ritter to speak with us. Our lead speaker today is extremely well qualified. Kim has worked on environmental issues in Asia for more than 40 years and is currently regional director of the Asia Foundation's Environment Program based in Bangkok. Please welcome Kim. Thank you, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. When I was invited to speak to you about a greener future, I guess I had to laugh a bit. I started working towards a greener future when I was 14 years old. I was protesting dam construction near my home in Tennessee. For the last 48 years, I've been working towards a greener future and clearly things have only gotten worse. So maybe I'm not the right guy for this talk. But anyway, thank you all for being here. And if, you're members, if you are members of Fridays for Future or any other environmental action group, which you all seem to be, then thank you again. You guys are my heroes. You have every right to be angry about the state of the planet, and you have every reason to be worried about the future. I have only 10 minutes today, and I want to try to frame this discussion a little bit differently. Some of what I will cover will be familiar, and some of it may be not so familiar. Mostly, I want to pose a few questions that I think have bearing on just how green the future will be. How you answer these questions is entirely up to you. I just ask that you think about them, because if you're going to join the fight, and I know most of you and probably all of you will, we have very little time to turn things around. So it's really important to pick your battles. And let's, so let's, <laughs> let's get to it. As the next slide suggests, I want to start with the elephant in the room, us. Humans are the most destructive species on the history of the planet. We are already 
We are only 1% of all life, less than 1% of all life, but we've already destroyed half of all plant life and 83% of all wild mammals. And we're just getting started. Much of this destruction comes from our voracious appetite for natural resources, an appetite that just gets bigger every year. As the next slide shows, as of the year 2000, the average person consumed nine metric tons of resources a year. 17 years later, that number has increased to 12 tons a year. Humans are consuming more resources per person per year, every year. That's one problem. And here's another problem. The global population is still growing. As the next slide shows, we are adding 80 million new souls to the global population every year. That's the population of Thailand, Laos, and New Zealand combined. 80 million extra humans that need food, clothing, shelter, education, healthcare, iPhones, whatever, each year. Currently, 10% of all people don't have enough food to eat. 13% don't have electricity, and half don't have access to essential health care. Is population growth something we should be worried about? Many economists will tell you we need a constantly growing population if we're going to maintain economic growth. But common sense tells us otherwise. Our planet is a finite system. How can it support a population of humans that is growing indefinitely, especially if we consume resources like a swarm of locusts. So what to do? That's question one. Question two, how do we get the existing population to consume less, not more? As resources become scarce, we can expect conflict to increase, and in fact, it already has. 40% of all intrastate armed conflicts are linked to natural resources. Access to water, fisheries, are already becoming national security issues for most countries. Population and rates of consum consumption are constant, growing stressors in our relationship to the planet. It makes every environmental problem worse. So what are we gonna do about it? I told you I'm just asking questions, not answering them. Next slide, please. Okay, switching gears. There's one issue that political leaders talk about more than climate change or anything else. You talk about the economy, that complex system by which each of us gets the goods and services that we need. And the biggest concern for economies is growth, the process by which we continually increase the production of goods and services per year per capita over time. Since, since the 17th century, we have learned that economic growth increases the standard of living uh, government, government revenues and the creation of jobs. And up to now, it's pretty much always worked. Quality of life has, in fact, increased decade after decade in terms of longevity, access to food, health, education, number of iPhones, and whatever other indicators we use. The problem, though, is humans are not the only species using the planet. And while our quality of life got better, it got worse for pretty much every other species. And it's about to get worse for us, too. Yet even now, people still count economic growth as more important than climate change. Why? Because humans prioritize what we need and want now. Food on the table, roof over our heads, and money in our pockets. We value these things much more highly than any threat that's going to hit us somewhere down the road. And it's understandable. But this leads to two schools of thought for how we're going to save the planet. Next slide, please. Optimists will argue that we can stick to our basic formula of economic growth. All we have to do is exchange renewable, renewable energy for fossil fuels, recycled materials for raw materials, and that's the basis of our green growth model. The opposing view says growth is so tightly linked the fossil fuels and raw materials that we will never be able to decouple them, let alone do it quickly enough to prevent global catastrophe. No matter how promising green growth sounds, there are way too many obstacles that will prevent us from shifting in time. 
And so we need to find an alternative model, one that ensures the protection of the planet and its ecosystems. This movement is called degrowth, and it focuses primarily on the need for humans to dramatically reduce consumption. It might sound crazy, but this movement is supported by over 11,000 scientists from all over the world. So the third question here is, can we shift to a green economy in time? And if we can't, what are we prepared to do about it? Next slide. Finally, our conversation today would be incomplete if I don't talk a little bit about what we learned from COVID-19. It was terrible, yes, but it also created a few opportunities. The first has to do with the mobilization of money. The transition to low carbon economies is very expensive because it requires rebuilding our infrastructure. The biggest challenge in doing so has always been getting our national governments to spend money. But in this post-COVID era, Countries are shelling out huge amounts of money to jumpstart their economies. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for these countries to use that money to rebuild their infrastructure and to lay the foundations to change their fundamental economic development trajectories. The last time something like this happened was in 2010, the global recession. Then as now, all major economies mobilize stimulus packages. In India, they invested their stimulus package into green technologies. And because of this, India has grown into a regional green tech powerhouse for the last 11 years as a result. We need to follow that example everywhere. We can use these stimulus packages to reshape the direction of our economies for the better. The second lesson we learned from COVID as shown in the next slide is that large sections of the economy don't need office buildings, they don't need us to be commuting to work every day, and they don't need so much business travel. Yes, we might have Zoom fatigue, but what a small price to pay for huge reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. We need to embed these changes into our, the way our economies work going forward. And finally, in the next slide, I want to talk a bit about what we learned from people's response to the threat of COVID. Within just three months of the global lockdown of April 2020, the US government mobilized $6 trillion to fight the pandemic. They were scared. The threat was immediate and it was on their doorstep. Coincidentally, $6 trillion is exactly what it would cost to transition the entire United States out of fossil fuels and into renewables. Now fast forward one year, Biden tries to pass an infrastructure bill for half this amount, about, 12, about $3 trillion, and with a big climate change component. What happened? Over the next five months, opposition forced him to whittle that bill down to only $1.2 trillion, with only half going to renewables. Why is it we can mobilize $6 trillion for COVID, but we're lucky to get half a trillion for climate change? As shown in the next slide, Studies have, been, have found that people not only respond much more decisively to immediate and tangible threats, but they tend to avoid dealing with future threats no matter how serious they may be. Apparently, the human brain is simply not wired to respond easily to large, slow-moving threats, which is exactly what climate change has been for the past several years. People just are not as scared as they should be. So how do we overcome this problem? I don't know, I don't have the answer. I have an idea, and I think it's a cool idea, but let me see what you think. I, I, I propose that it would be very interesting to use gaming technology. Virtual reality is a powerful platform. Wouldn't it be cool to build a true to life, scientifically accurate, problem solving game for policymakers and frankly, for all of us? where players can move back and forth through time to see the impacts of good and bad decisions on the state of the world. To work, this game has to be able to scare the bejesus out of players. That would be cool. Last slide. In closing, let me just say, I'm sorry for the state of the world we have left to you, but it's in your hands now. So good luck and Godspeed. Thank you. 
Thanks uh, so much, Kim, for that great address. And can I just reassure you of two things? Uh, first of all, uh, you're absolutely in the right section and you, gave, you, you, you earned your right to speak in this um, just to allay your concerns there. And secondly, I don't think anyone watching this suffered any Zoom fatigue during your presentation. So thank you very much. We'll come back to you soon uh, for questions. Uh, but I would like to now introduce our second speaker in this session, Juan Jose Guzman, who is based in Chile. His areas of expertise are human rights, environmental studies, climate change, and indigenous people's rights. He works at the NGO No Peace Without Justice as a project associate in a program that seeks to achieve accountability for deforestation and human rights violations in Amazonia. Please welcome Juan Jose. Good afternoon, distinguished APEC dele delegations and fellow youth delegates. I'm Juan Jose Guzman from Chile, and I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the importance of building international commitment and support for the respect and protection for, of the environment while consolidating a more inclusive, culturally diverse, and human rights-oriented future for humanity. More than ever, it has become imperative to adjust our economies to the current historical challenges. We are all probably tired of hearing bad news from having the largest of the five ocean plastic accumulation zones lying on the Pacific Ocean to the out of control deforestation rates in Amazonia. It seems that day after day and year after year, we accumulate bad news, while worrying phenomena such as climate anxiety appear, leading to an increasing and generalized feeling of being powerless in the youth. The latest IPCC report highlights the urgency of addressing the climate crisis. At this rhythm, a few years from now, we will be looking back to 2021 thinking how stable things were. The pandemic has compounded with the climate crisis to underscore the importance of sustainable and inclusive development, meaning not only to distribute the spoils of growth a bit better, but shifting towards a model in which prosperity does not harm human communities and ecosystems. I am an anthropologist specialized in human rights. As I was now introduced, I currently work on implementing a project that seeks to end deforestation and to achieve accountability for human rights and environmental violations in Amazon. As part of my work, I have had the chance to see the struggles of indigenous peoples, as well as the valuable knowledge they hold for protecting the natural environment. Indigenous peoples often lack formal recognition over their natural resources and territories are often uh, last to receive public investments in basic services and infrastructure and face obstacles to fully participating in the formal economy, in political activities, and in decision-making. However, indigenous peoples use, occupy, and own a quarter of the world's surface area, safeguarding 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Also, they hold vital ancestral knowledge and expertise on mitigating, adapting, and reducing disaster and climate risks. Throughout my career, I have encountered an, an, an unacceptable number of cases of indigenous lands and territories devastated under the excuse of development, as well as massive human displacements and horrible harassment to environmental defenders. As the climate crisis intensifies, violence against those protecting their lands and our planet also increases. People are losing their homes and ways of living, they are being dispossessed from their cultures and having their voices silenced. This clearly states that we are losing the opportunity to include other economies, other voices, and other perspectives into our growth or our perception of growth. Wouldn't it be possible then for a greener future to instead embrace cultural diversity, learn from other economies that coexist more coherently with the natural environment, and bring more voices into the discussion instead of silencing them? There is a fundamental disconnection between human rights and economic performance and development. However, when development partners and investors consider the human rights of local communities, harm is avoided and prosperity can reach everybody. Human rights are interconnected and interrelated, and it has been proven that environmental devastation breaches them as a whole. For example, the right to adequate food, land, health, and culture are usually affected together and they in turn create instability, diminishing well-being and future development. In my experience working in the Amazon, I have witnessed the catastrophic consequences of deforestation due to cattle ranching, illegal logging, mining, and other practices. However, forest areas in Latin America that are managed by indigenous communities have much lower deforestation rates. 
I have seen exciting initiatives where indigenous economies have received aid to start inspiring projects that raise awareness, allow external people uh, to get to know other models, improve their economic stability, and promote, promote greater buy-in. For instance, concerning the lack of soap and other personal protection supplies for stopping the spread of COVID-19 in isolated areas of the Amazon, some indigenous communities developed soap manufacturing processes to cover the demand in their communities, innovating, creating new jobs for women, uh, avoiding dramatic environmental impacts and contributing to control the spread of the virus. As a constructive opinion, I invite the economists present to hold dialogues with local communities. I can, I can ensure they have well-grounded knowledge on administering and using the resources as anybody else. In that way, we can guarantee participation and remain open to exploring alternative ways of dealing with environmental problems locally to later exchange this knowledge to think regionally and globally. One of the many common aspects of the economies that compose APEC is that our societies are very diverse and we should dive into that, that, that diversity. Therefore, it would be a great initiative, for instance, to conduct joint assessments of the alternative ways local communities have to preserve their, their, their environments and then have horizontal dialogues to further cooperate and integrate our region in its complexity and richness. APEC is a unique, powerful forum and it would be truly inspiring to see indigenous representatives, community leaders, and the most vulnerable groups to climate change and the negative side effects of mass production, business, and trade, as we know it today, speak and indeed impact on the decision-making structures. This is not only with the aim of achieving important and of course, very meaningful representation, but also as a means to improve our decision-making processes. Another constructive path our economies could explore is running consultations that include local communities to produce realistic impact assessments of development projects, trade strategies, and economic policies. Also, further investment in capacity building for increasing their exports and trade, as well as preparing professionals and setting up specialized bodies for intercultural dialogue is essential to help them succeed in the world economy especially given the significant challenges they must overcome to break long-standing discrimination. There is also a cultural dimension to all this. There is so much we can learn from other perspectives, perspectives and ways of relating to nature. We just need to remain open to, for example, trade systems that are based on reciprocity, not just among human beings, but also with nature. In my years working with Latin American communities, I have learned about Andean and Amazonian nature conceptions that transcend the understanding of nature as a passive object that exists for the sake of satisfying human needs. Instead, for them, it is an active subject that should be protected and respected because of its intrinsic value. Therefore, I want to ask you all, would it be interesting to explore this further in such pressing times? The promise of a greener future should envisage a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality, and non-discrimination, where cultural diversity is respected and appreciated. Thus, another constructive pathway would be to strengthen our accountability measures where those responsible for human, and, uh, for human rights and environmental violations face justice for the actions committed also allowing us to develop non-repetition guarantees. We must cooperate and carry out concerted and multilateral actions to face the climate crisis and heal our economies from violence. As I mentioned in the beginning, I don't want to sense this general feeling of being powerless in the youth anymore. For that, our economies can find constructive pathways in holding more substantial dialogue, consultations, capacity building programs, and transparent impact assessments. In addition, we must ensure that green development is in line with the communities that are supposed to benefit and prosper from it. Finally, we need a human rights-based approach and set more vital accountability precedents, establishing healthy channels for knowledge exchange. We need to put the demands and views of those most impacted by climate change at the heart of environmental policies. Their perspectives are valuable for decision-making and for achieving truly inclusive greener growth and prosperity for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan Jose, for a really passionate uh, address there.
Uh, we now have some questions for both Juan Jose and for uh, Kim. So for that, I would like to first ask Brunei to ask uh, their question. Okay. Hello, selamat pagi. Um, so I have two questions for Kim Durider and Juan Jose Guzman. Um, the first question is for Kim. Have you any idea on what contributes more to our inability for a greener economy mm -hmm. and how could the youth contribute to it? The second question is for um, Juan Jose. How was he able to, um, how are you able to connect the indigenous communities or individuals in engaging for a greener future? Um, did you face any challenges? Because um, in Brunei we did have a bit of a hard time to connect us with the rural um, communities to go forward for a greener future. Thank you. You asked uh, what are the what are the obstacles or the inability to, to, to shift to a greener future? Um, there are quite a few. First of all, if we're going to follow a green growth model, we don't have any experience with a green growth model. There's no country in the world that is 100% green growth. Uh, it's an experiment, and an experiment that we hope is going to work, but um, uh, we're barely getting started, and we're going to make lots of mistakes because we don't know. Plus, it's very easy to call something green when it's not really green. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do, you know, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, say, by 10% and say, oh, we've achieved, you know, something green. But, you know, it's just green wash. It's just, it's, it just looks good. Uh, that's, that's one challenge. Another challenge is uh, our entire infrastructure is built for fossil fuels. So... Every time we want to make, you know, increase our energy production, it's so much easier just to uh, add an incremental cost to buy more coal to run the, pop, uh, the, the coal fire power plant than it is to tear down that power plant and build a whole new, you know, uh, wind power, solar power. Uh, it's basically having to rebuild the infrastructure. So, um, so our whole our infrastructure is kind of set up for the status quo. Uh, that's another problem. A third problem is think of all the companies, all the people who've invested their life savings in fossil fuels. These are people who don't want to see a change. They don't, they don't, they're going to lose everything they have. So it's, it's not, and you know, it's not uncommon. And this is, happens in almost every country. You have Ministry of, uh, of Climate Change, go to COP26 and say, we're going we're gonna to reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions. We're going to you know, make a big change in our country. But they're talking with one voice. And back home, the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Energy, they're talking with a different voice. They are still trying to keep their economy chugging along, and they're going to do it as cheaply as possible with the system they have. So you, in almost every country, you have almost a schizophrenia where you've got the climate change people trying to do something about climate change and the economic development and the energy people doing on a completely different track. So getting these, uh, you know, getting a, a, a government just to speak with one voice. And so that's just kind of the beginnings of uh, some of the problems you're going to encounter in this transition. Um, what can youth do? Some of the most profound changes that we have seen in, in, in our lifetime happen because of youth. So, uh, 50 years ago, there were three people, not much older than you, they created, they're, they're MIT students, and they created a model of what the world was going to be if we kept using natural resources the way we do, following an economic growth trajectory. And they basically said, sometime in the 21st century, the world is going to crash. Uh, they wrote a book about it, and it's called Limits to Growth. Uh, and it had a profound effect on the way people thought. And I think it was a precursor to this idea of degrowth. These were young people, but they were creative people. And they were all 27, 28, 29, 30 years old when they wrote this book. Uh, they're all in their 80s now. One of them's passed away. But you know, some of the best ideas are going to come from youth. We have to be thinking out of the box. We have to 
think very creatively. Certainly protest is a good thing. I'm a big fan of protest and it puts pressure and keep the pressure up and keep it going. But also think, what are, what are the issues that, that, that where, what are the pressure points? Where, where are the ways in which you can change um, things for the better? What, where do you weigh in on some of these bigger issues of, yeah, is, is green growth even realistic? Uh, and what are we going to do if it's not realistic? And then lastly, I really like this idea of, of uh, a virtual reality platform. I think virtual reality is a great learning tool, and I think we need to learn it, use it a lot more than we already do. And your generation knows a whole lot more about gaming technology than mine does. We could learn from you on that. So there, there, I think the sky's the limit on what youth can do. Sorry, I, that's long-winded, but that's it. Thank you. Um, Juan, Juan Jose, would you like to address uh, Brunei's question as well? Yes, sure. Thank you very much for the question. Um, first of all, I would like to start by saying that um, every person on earth is powerful and is an actor of change. Uh, the same applies to indigenous peoples. Um, even if they are some, most of the times um, oppressed to some extent by the power structures of their societies, they are voices of this greener future that we are all discussing, active voices that are playing a, sig a significant role. Um, it is not, from my perspective at least, and, and, and following my experience, it is not just um, something, the question should not be just how we can include them in the fight, but it's also what they are doing and how, what can we learn from them. They have been struggling with environmental devastation for centuries, since the colonization in every corner of the world. Uh, their natural environments have been completely destroyed in many cases. For instance, in, in following again my working experience, in the case of Latin America by extractive industries, or in Amazonia, for example, if we think about it, uh, deforestation is something that is not new. Now it became more popular because of the huge fires in, to, in 2019, but the problem comes way before with oil extraction and with other um, things that we use for ending our current economy um, and development models. So, in my personal experience, I have learned a lot from indigenous peoples and from indigenous youth. They are super active. Now, um, I was having a chat today with, with some of them that are at COP26 um, and all the advocacy that they are carrying out, all these platforms that they have built are truly trying to change the dominant perspective of what really is development because for some and for 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 most of the of the dominant economies because also i want to stress the fact that we have several economies there is nothing such as, as an indigenous way of doing things or indigenous economy they are extremely diverse so we have many options and the option that we're following now in our current times in the dominant world is one of the many possibilities that that are uh, ahead of us so um, going back to what I was saying before, what they're doing is truly amazing and they are engaging. What it would be great, for instance, um, in this forum would be to include them in decision-making, would be to include them truly in uh, the green policies that we're reflecting on for the future for all humanity. Because if we are talking about all humanity, we're talking about everyone in the world and not just people who enjoy the um, dominant um, aspects and uh, uh, of growth. If yeah, thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is going to uh, be coming from Chinese Taipei. So I could ask the delegate from there to ask their question. So my question is to Director uh, Dorita, and uh, my question is similar to that of Renai actually, but I'm going to try to. Uh, press the issue of accountability and clarity here. So my question is, what are some of the specific challenges uh, that you face this year when carrying out sustainability works in local uh, Asia Pacific economies? Good question. Um, uh, this year, economies were pretty much in a state of turmoil uh, because of the, um, 
uh, because of the, the COVID situation. Uh, most of this past year, countries were still reeling from, uh, from the situation. Uh, I, I know Thailand was in lockdown uh, repeatedly, um, and largely because um, uh, they, they have a, a, um, immigrants coming across the border, illegal immigrants that carried a lot of the, the COVID. And, um, and illegal immigrants were, in fact, a, a really critical part of the Thai economy. Um, so, um, so local businessmen, you know, invited them in, they wanted them there, but they were also, um, you know, they, they, they were part of the source of super spreaders just because they, they did not have access to good services. And most of the countries of Asia, I think, were struggling this whole last year with getting COVID under control. So, um, I, 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 maybe this year is probably not the best example to describe how to deal with COVID-19. I will say, you know, at the start of the pandemic, um, we had blue skies. We had, we had blue skies in, in Delhi for the first time in 20 years. We had, we had turtles laying eggs on Patong Beach in, in Thailand for the first time in, in a decade. We, we, we saw wildlife on the streets, you know, in big cities. Um, and it was because of lockdown. It's because people were home. And and it was like, um, it was a little bit beautiful, but then there was also some really serious challenges because in, in, in many countries, uh, they didn't have the, the, um, the infrastructure to deal with lockdown for the, 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 um, the laborers. So the labor class, they, they sent them home. I mean, in India, they, God, they, they treated them very poorly. They sent them all back. Most of them had to walk back to their villages because there was no place for them to be in lockdown in the big cities. And what did they do back at their, their hometown? They, they had no income. They had no, no social safety net. Um, and so they started going into the forest and, and harvesting forest products. They, you know, they, they tried to do a bit of farming. They did a lot of fishing. And the natural resource base in and around these villages got terribly degraded. Um, because these countries did not have a social safety net to deal with the needs for, you know, the, 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 the members of the, the labor class. And, um, and these, I, I really appreciate the fact that we, I'm sharing this session with Juan Jose Guzman, and he's talking about human rights, uh, because human rights is a very excellent lens to use to address, um, environmental issues. Every human being, if they're going to be on this planet, they should have the right clean air, clean water, food, livelihood, uh, basic human services. Um, I, I don't think I'm answering your question, but sorry, you hit, you hit a nerve and it made me think about these other issues that have been going on, uh, inequality issues across, across Asia this past year, and it has really exacerbated anybody's effort to do anything in, in green growth, uh, because it just, it basically, it exposed how poorly set up most of our economies were across Asia to deal with something as monumental as COVID-19. Thank you, Kim. Um, Juan Jose, we just have one minute left in this, in this section, but I wondered if you might like to say anything just to add to what Kim has just spoken about. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kim, and for uh, also the delegates for the question. Um, yes, I would like to add, following the human rights approach that Kim mentioned in the end, I think that is super important because human rights are a universal, um, are universal tools that apply for everyone and that everyone has them. Even if your country has not ratified a particular treaty or, or it doesn't matter, in spite of anything, you, you will always have human rights. They are truly universal. And it's a common ground for humanity. Self-determination, the right to culture, even the right to development, which are already recognized rights, um, play a significant role in how we will mitigate and adapt to climate change. Basically because the destruction of the environment uh, entails necessarily a breach to human rights as a whole, as I said in my intervention. So the, Recently, 
the recent discussions that have been around the, the right to a clean and healthy environment, which are on really good track, um, are very inspiring. And actually, the youth was widely consulted across the world. And it wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't um, a matter of you know, destiny that such recognition took place. It was because people articulated politically and went out to the streets to demand a change, to demand this recognized in conjunction with civil society, in conjunction with indigenous peoples, with youth, with women, with people from all around the world. So I just want to add that we must be political. Of course, always with a very diplomatic tone and all the, and all the, the, the necessary things and steps that are important to take before delivering a particular message, but it's incredibly important to not give up because even in spite of the fact that human rights are there, we still have a lot to do in terms of enforcement. And that is something where society at large plays a role. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan Jose. I think that's a really nice place to leave it. Um, and thank you to both of you, Juan Jose and Kim, for sharing your expertise with us here today in what's been a very interesting session. Uh, before we go into our next theme, we're going to take another uh, look at another delegate video. Papua New Guinea is a nation of opportunities and challenges. Embracing the digital future and technologies is ideal for enabling a digital transformation in PNG and leapfrogging traditional brick and mortar approaches. With this embracement, we are able to reach across the geographies, income levels and cultures. This new global era of connectivity and digital innovation brings opportunity and empowerment for people, firms and governments. Digital technologies hold huge potential for achieving the sustainable development goals and tackling global environmental challenges. In the last decade, four out of 10 jobs in Papua New Guinea were created in highly digital intensive sectors and digital deliverable services now make up a quarter of total services trade. Data, a critical resource with unprecedented volume and velocity, is powering new businesses and new technologies such as artificial intelligence. In Papua New Guinea, however, the transition can be abrupt and disorienting for citizens. Competition dynamics are being transformed, raising questions about increased concentration and inequalities, and the disparity in the use of digital technologies is contributing to a widening productivity gap between those organizations that are leading and those that are upcoming. There is a dire need to bridge digital divides and narrow these digital gaps, including those related to gender, income, geography, and culture, and ensure people have the right skills and capabilities and social protection to succeed in this digital world. Papua New Guinea needs more protection to privacy, consumer rights, and child safety. Strengthen digital security and tackle disinformation, terrorism, and violent extremism online. As the voices of the future, we believe the world of tomorrow will depend on the policy choices we make today. We believe that the embracement of the digital future will deliver new analysis and evidence to support the whole of government perspective on digital transformation policy. This will also help our economy assess the state of digital development and formulate policy strategies and approaches. Going digital will push ahead issues including data governance, online platforms and measurement. This will help PNG facilitate global discussions and align us to global standards for the digital age, including the private sector's recommendation on artificial intelligence. We believe that this is just a glimpse road of what is ahead. We, the Papua New Guinean delegates of the APEC Voices of the Future, will continue to serve as evidence-based, best practice policy compasses for our economy to navigate towards an inclusive digital future. Thank you very much, Papua New Guinea. Uh, we now come to our final theme for today, a future for all. This session is a reminder that economic development and socioeconomic progress are only meaningful if they create opportunities for all people. And in particular, those communities that have been historically marginalized are given an opportunity to share in the benefits.
We have two speakers to introduce this topic to us today. Professor Edwina Pio of Auckland University of Technology and Mayumi Sato, who is a Canadian PhD student at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Before I introduce them in more detail, let's hear from the lead drafters of the Youth Declaration, Preeta Dita Hapsari Priambodo from Indonesia and Braden Parnell from Australia, about what the Declaration says in the area of a future for all. Thank you so much, Tim. Hello, everyone. Selamat pagi from Jakarta. Kia ora. I'm Preeta, one of the lead drafters of the topic of a future for all, alongside with Braden and also a representative from the Indonesian economy. After several days of vigorous drafting sessions together with Australia, New Zealand, Russia, and China, we've concluded four key points that we considered consequential in creating a sustainable future for all, regardless of their backgrounds for a more empowered world. We organized the youth statements of the past, the youth gather today, and the one trillion young people will follow us in the next 50,000 years. We issue you the following challenges to make a future for all a reality. First of all, we prioritize uh, the measurement, what matters into Apex conversation and work. We believe by expanding the focus beyond economic development will be positive to our future. We urge leaders to first measure what matters, second, encouraging economies to adopt this model for inclusion and economic prosperity, and third, to recognize and include more humanistic and holistic measures of economic development uh, as we prioritize hum more humanism and human first. And, um, and the fourth of all, it should invest in the skills and knowledge of women, indigenous people, linguistically diverse people, and other socially disadvantaged groups and ensure security through education and the transfer of knowledge across generations. As our second point is actually focusing on suitable and quality education for all. We need to develop education standards shaped by the voices of our youth, migrant, and indigenous communities to build socially and culturally responsive education models of the future. Uh, we, see, we also see that the education of young people being key to the APEC continuous social cohesion. Uh, and the next point, the third and fourth point, will be conveyed by my, my great partner, Brayden. The floor is yours. Kia all everyone, and thank you for having me today. I, I just must recognize that I speak from Larrakia land, the land of the Yoni Maka people here in Australia. And I must recognize that this land was never formally ceded, and to this day, we have no treaty. Uh, as Prita said, I, I represent the Australian economy and all the economies bound up within the Future for All drafting group. Uh, and we constructed uh, within the APEC statement a call to action uh, that recognises uh, the continued work of young people in the past and the continued exclusion of people on the basis of their identity and the economic strife that that obviously causes. Um, we know that there are always going to be young people fighting, uh, for we recognise now more than ever the importance of, of centering our diverse communities and centering our own vulnerability to protect that. Uh, and where the past has shown that hierarchy uh, often leaves these groups at greater risk, our strategy is to develop uh, a safety net that defines economic success as starting with these diverse communities, embracing and prioritizing their success through the economy. And, and remembering that, as our guest speakers have said, that we are ultimately in control of our economic abstractions and that they must benefit everyone, not the top tier. So thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for that summary. Now, our first speaker for this topic is Edwina Pio. Edwina is New Zealand's first Professor of Diversity and University Director of Diversity at the Auckland University of Technology. A prolific writer, her research is published in leading international journals and media outlets, and she has written over half a dozen books. You can find further details in the biographic note. Edwina, over to you. Kia Mai no tatu katoa, ko Edwina Pio taku enoa. He tangata tiriti aho, no rera tena tatu katoa. Welcome to Exploring Diversity and Inclusion and a Future for All. Now my hare mai, tena kotu, tena kotu. Ina iwi, ina rio, ina manga, ina awa, tena kotu katoa. What if our actions were imbued with the sacred? What if activism evokes better local society and responsible global community? What if sacred activism 
signals the performance of a deeper understanding and mindful actions for contextualizing a woven future for all. And as my heart is overflowing, Harikoa Takunaka, on this eventful day, these are some of the questions I pose to you, our future Rangatira, my distinguished global audience. Given the thematic and spatial canvas of these terms, a future for all, a variety of strands will be sewn into my sharing with you. Some spangles, sequins, and light and dark threads. Let us remember what the 14th Dalai Lama said. If you think you are too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Diversity, that fun, funky, and formidable word that is tossed around, pushed under the carpet, or spotlighted as we grapple with the difference. In its simplest avatar, diversity is difference. And this could mean gender, age, religion, marital status, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and a host of other dimensions, such as political beliefs, intelligence, work experience, and education. Diversity plays an important part in the implementation of core public values and good citizenship behavior, while also enhancing social mobility, innovation, and a higher profitability footprint. Inclusion is currently added to the diversity lexicon to ensure that all individuals contribute and flourish within nations. Diversity and inclusion are always politically charged. They are a complex weave of historical and socioeconomic legacies. These weaves affect the practices of organizations and society. Diversity can be an awkward passage for it challenges, disrupts, shifts centers of gravity, and to be truly beneficial, it must be more than box ticking and window dressing. Patterns of the known are more comfortable, particularly if there is a blight ignorance of cultures and ossified leadership practices. A Cherokee elder is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight and it is between two wolves. One is evil, he is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, superiority, false pride. The elder continued, the other is good. That wolf is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, kindness, compassion, humility. And the same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute. Hmm. And then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. In a world that is rich and impoverished, wonderful and hateful, generous and greedy, characterized by economic and social inequalities, with disparities in employment and development, alternative possibilities suggest that one look for a blend of Western approaches and Eastern and indigenous perspectives. And this may include what Jalaluddin Rumi, the Sufi mystic and poet said, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. In the Western tradition and borrowing from the Latin poet Horace, Immanuel Kant framed the European enlightenment with the motto, sapere ode, dare to know, with a focus on the attitude of spirit by which inquiry was done. The Nobel laureate Amartya Sen urges us to move away from the miniaturization of human beings and to take responsibility for our choices 
and reasoning. In a future for all, we need to move away from solitary identities and traditions to see beyond a fragmentary logic and imagine other worlds and other lives in the interstices beyond the binary oppositions such as East-West, Muslim and non-Muslim, Christian and non-Christian, in which we trap ourselves. A small sample of the diverse categories I belong to include woman, deeply spiritual, citizen of New Zealand, mother, daughter, friend, diversity scholar, employee at the Auckland University of Technology, visiting professor at a number of prestigious international universities, scholar of color, strong proponent of minority rights, while at the same time stressing putting back into the kete or the basket of life. What is one's contribution for the privilege of living on this fragile planet? My life's journey has been an endeavor to make inquiry more wonderful, to push beyond conventional frameworks and to acknowledge the need for shared wonder as life unfolds. The vocabulary of hope often brushed aside as sanctimonious nonsense inherently presents relational possibilities and a perspective on the future that is often lacking in today's world. Hope is an elusive quality that all of us possess through which we can potentially make our dreams come true. It requires us to be willing to challenge ourselves in new ways that may epitomize the wisdom of the sacred. Hope forces us to engage with real world issues, theories and practices in novel ways. And we've got to think of hope in the context of five key motives crucial for implementing a more inclusive future for all. Demographic patterns, consider global mobility, and the growth of non-traditional migrants in Western countries. The total number of immigrants at mid-year 2020 is approximately 280.6 million. And the total number of refugees at the end of 2020 is approximately 82.4 million. What about religious growth? Multiple religions diffuse historically religious monopolies and drive religious diversity. Corridors of commerce, the BRICS countries, the Asia Pacific region and the importance of APEC, and of course, halal countries, which are billion dollar markets. We must also factor in human rights, a fusion of the sacred and secular, accommodation and good faith, requiring people to consider the common good and reduce individualism that often turns into fundamentalist ideologies with my rights only rather than rights and duties. And finally, for this context, how can we bring our whole selves to work? With the knowledge that we have to also consider the distribution of power, which shapes social roles, expectations and meanings. And so three questions which I put to you, the youth and all those who are listening to this talk. What are our diversity and inclusion discourses? Do we measure them? Like the previous speaker said, how can we interact with stories of difference and commonality to circumvent otherness? And how can we expand circles of inclusiveness? Ask yourself, how is diversity accepted and implemented in your homes, your friendship circles and workplaces? Raising social cultural awareness and consciousness can explode a skewed understanding of diversity. We do need government as well to make changes, to render societies more beneficial to humanity and reduce 
the negative consequences that take place, for example, through COVID. We want accountability at all levels, but we also want contribution at all levels, and in particular for our youth, Anai Rangatira Ho Apopo. We must bless our uncommon future. We need an inclusive, less arrogant, and more attuned approach to social knowledge and action, including a global appreciation and respect for diversity. Minorities too and youth need to challenge the model of victimization and stand tall and resilient without haughtiness, but with dignity, respect, and know-how to negotiate the rivers of our lives. A future for all has to be constructed, deconstructed, and reconstructed. Global migration has ensured that societies have a rich base of skills, qualifications, and talents. Migration has also clearly complicated simple divisions such as work and religion, private and public, the sacred and secular. The diaspora tends to unsettle existing stasis in societies and urges the need for multiple voices to be acknowledged. In a woven universe, we are all intimately linked, and each of us is called to be future makers through respectful, reciprocal relationships. These questions encourage somersaults beyond tepid policies, and the discipline of playing the right notes in the right order, in the full knowledge that in the cartography of our lives, Grueling work and patience are required for miracles and for creating magic. And as the Sufi poet Hafiz said, I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy. My heart is too heavy for me to remember that I have been called to dance, the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up, and to lift others up. Untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my spirit, that we might dance, and that our dancing might be contagious. Homie, huye, taikie, kia tauti marie, aroha, amen. Thank you very much, Edwina, for a, a very thought-provoking address. And please stay there. We'll, we'll be back with you for our questions shortly. But our final speaker is Mayumi Sato, a PhD student at Cambridge University in the UK. Mayumi has worked in North America, Europe, and Asia on climate and social justice-related issues and is interested in the way that different trends come together to shape our future. Unfortunately, Mayumi, Mayumi isn't able to join us live, but she has sent us through her address. Hi everyone, my name is Mayumi Sato. I am 27 years old. Uh, I go by she and her. I am originally from Japan, but I'm currently based in Cambridge in the United Kingdom where I'm currently studying. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge uh, in sociology, where I focus on the intersection between climate change, racism and settler colonialism and the prison industry. So I'm really thankful for this invite, for the ability to talk to you today. Um, I imagine that you've had a great first day at the event yesterday, and I hope that you're continuing with the great discussions with your peers over the course of the program. So I just want to start off with a, with a short anecdote. Um, this past week, I was in Glasgow attending COP26, which I'm sure many of you have probably been reading about, or perhaps you might have even been there um, or watching virtually. Um, and there were so many discussions around the inequities of who could go and and who was represented and the exorbitant costs of um, of attending and the lack of representation uh, from indigenous folks and those from the global south. Um, some of the hotels were costing around nine thousand pounds a week. 
So even though it was framed by the UK government to be the most inclusive COP ever, we saw a lot of superficial promises made um, and a lot of important and diverse voices and narratives around climate justice were being erased. Um, so the quote on this, that you see on the screen is one that I really like because I often find that in times of politically or socially contentious events or issues like COP, those who are often left-leaning um, can oftentimes be the most silent. And as the session is about building a future for all, it's really critical to remember that everything must be intersectional uh, in our response and, and that we know that everything is interrelated. Um, and I think COVID really taught us that, right? That we don't live in a vacuum and that our individual actions and behaviors have consequences and that involves the language of silence. So as I talk to you today, if there is any point that I want to get across, um, it's that if you do see injustice, I always feel that we should collectively be speaking out. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we have to necessarily be overtly vocal. I think this is where context really matters. In some places that I've lived, there are severe consequences for speaking out. And I think that that's particularly the case if you are a marginal, from a marginalized identity group. But I think that my address to you today is really about how we can become strong allies and redefine what leadership looks like to build a future for all. So oftentimes when we talk about uh, leadership, it's framed around this very um, uniform notion, very uh, centered around masculine and, and white ideals. And so I want to talk about the many ways in which we can lead, um, particularly as it relates to building an equitable future. So this is actually a panel on resilience and multi-solving the climate crisis at COP26. And you can see something here that is quite rare, which is that all of the panelists are from the global south. They're from various continents and they're also young. Um, and one of the reasons here for this is because the organizers who um, plan the event are truly allies to this cause and, and committed to diversifying the ability to produce and share knowledge in public spaces around equity. Um, and so this really brings up several questions around representation. So when it comes to representation, we really need to keep in mind who is speaking, who is moderating, who is selecting the speakers, what are they saying, and what are the narratives that they are, are advancing? And I'm sure that um, perhaps many of you might have some reflections from attending the event yourselves at APEC right now. So in terms of um, rewriting these actual narratives that we find dominant in our society, you know, oftentimes in school or in work or in advocacy um, and mainstream events like COP and at the UN, we often find that the narratives produced are very homogenous. And so that means, you know, whether through class background, race, geography, country or gender, it's often the same folks who are given the same opportunities, who are given the platform, and traditionally, they don't really say anything that challenges the status quo. And so as I talk to you today, um, I really engage, I, I'm hoping that as you engage with APEC, um, I really encourage you in your advocacy and in your, your social justice careers and your work to really think about um, the power that you hold in rewriting narratives. Um, and of course, that involves a few steps. So I'm just going to talk a bit about them. So one, you know, understanding what the dominant power structures are, you know, what are folks saying, who are saying these dominant narratives, what is the context in which these narratives are being used, are they being used to suppress other people's rights. And if you do this, you will find that no matter the issue, um, oftentimes you'll find that the demographics of those in power have several similarities. And even if not, you'll notice that the ways in which those who have this hegemony often resort to similar strategies to advance their own power at the expense of others. So for instance, I can say that having lived in Canada for a few years, you know, if you look at Canadian history, um, you look at the national reckoning with settler colonialism, which is obviously still very minimal, it's often compared to Australia because, you know, during the stolen generations in Australia and the 60s scoop in Canada, indigenous children were stolen from their families, they were removed from their homes, they were indoctrinated with these so-called, um, these dominant white colonial norms that stripped them 
of their identity, of their religion, of their language, and of their culture. And so even though we see that there is very, that context is very important, there are some fundamental similarities um, in the power structure of oppression. So despite this, once you've identified this, you can start to build counter narratives and elevate the narratives of those who are on the margins. And one of the best things about being in attendance at this event is that I'm sure you've had the time to talk to each other um, with your delegations. And I think that, you know, despite the kinds of failures and criticisms that we see at events like COP, um, the strength lies in that you will be able to meet other young people who are incredibly passionate and who are organizing organizing around the same issues, you know, whether that is anti-racism or climate justice or indigeneity um, or around multidimensional poverty. So once you've um, built these counter narratives, you can then um, go on to actually operationalizing them and put them into action. So whether that's protest or spoken word or literature, this is really where you sustain your organizing and how you amplify your resistance, right? And this is actually the process whereby we are able to collectively start to shift narratives around justice and how we challenge governments and how we challenge decision makers who are actively hurting our environment you know, those who are supporting systems of racial injustice, you know, those who are widening the socioeconomic gap, this is how we actually take our words and put them into action. So I did mention this previously um, as I wrap up, but I do want to bring this up again in that this is this doesn't mean that resistance is a linear um, um, pathway. You know, oftentimes when we think about resistance, we think that it involves protesting on the street or leading a demonstration, but actually you can express your resistance in so many ways. And in particular, um, sometimes when you do come from a marginalized background, we understand that, you know, protesting or overt expressions of resistance can actually put us in a precarious situation. And so finding what really appeals to you and the mode through which you feel is most effective in challenging hegemonic norms, that is the kind of medium that I encourage you to take. And that might be writing, you know, that might be art, it might be education. So it's really important to find your, your niche. So, I mean, I can say, speaking from experience, coming, um, being at a place like Cambridge, having not grown up with the same resources as some of my classmates, I've kind of developed even sentiments of anger and frustration myself. And I realized that if I truly want to build a future for all, I was going to have to do something beyond words. And so I know where my strengths lie. And so this is just an example of what you can do. And there's so many organizations that are mobilizing this. But just last year, I started an educational justice that helps low income racialized youth um, carry out social justice projects and try to break that systemic barrier in higher education, which has traditionally excluded their presence. And so Obviously, this is just one of many ways, but I think that it's important to find something that you're really passionate about and what really drives you, but then use that um, and, and try to operationalize it and try to do something based on, on those emotions that you feel. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, you can ha drive a community level project that contributes to a larger global process of equity. I mean, change takes time. And so um, I would say that, you know, don't discount the local level grassroots organizing. So I just want to leave you on that that note. I'm, I'm really thankful for um, your, your attention and the ability to um, invite me to speak in front of you today. I hope that you have a great rest of the session. Um, I know that I was supposed to be there. Um, so if you do have any questions or comments or suggestions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, the organizing team should have my email. So thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Mayumi. And hopefully some of the delegates take you up on that offer uh, and reach out to you. But, but now we have uh, some questions from our delegates uh, for you, Edwina. Uh, so I would like to ask China, please, for their delegation to ask their question. Hello, everyone. Uh, our questions are about online education. Based on the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, education remotely has developed with rock speed. The heavy demand, not only on schools and universities, but also on the market, massive resources and capital into the online education industry. However, the quality and standards very essential parts on education. 
So the first question here is about how to supervision online education for youth. Then when the pandemic ends, shall online education continues to develop as it does of this period? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, China delegation, for your excellent questions. Yes, online teaching has become the norm. Uh, I think that changes the spirit of the manner in which teaching is done. It adds another layer of complexity. And because one cannot network in person or have face-to-face -face contact uh, in actual time, it does make it much more complicated. I know, for example, that our university has given out a number of laptops, including uh, data, to people who have found it difficult to have their own laptops. And I think that's one way of closing the inequity gap. When COVID finishes, I don't know whether it will finish or we'll just get used to working in a COVID world. But if we come back to our universities or to our schools or our work in person, I think blended learning will continue and that's going to be the norm. So you get the best of both worlds. Thank you. Um, could, I, could I please ask uh, the New Zealand delegation to ask their question for Edwina? Kia ora, Edwina. Namahi nui ki akwe. Uh, thank you for your korero um, earlier. Um, I'm calling in from um, Tamaki Makoto here in Auckland. Um, so our question for you is, uh, what role can youth play in changing the perception of, of us measuring success to move away from GDP? I think we need to be able to measure success also by looking at happiness, also by looking at well-being and looking at the more diversity that we have so that it reflects the communities in which our organizations and our universities are embedded. I think that would be key so we move away from GDP. GDP also is quite a narrow way and a more traditional way of looking at uh, how we measure things. I think we also have to measure, um, let's say if we are looking at a future for all, um, who are the people who work in our organizations? Who are the people on our boards? And even if we have a certain ethnicity and a certain gender who are at the top level, who are the people in the pipeline who we are training, who we are nurturing, who we are mentoring to come forward with a time frame? And data speaks. So what is the kind of data we choose to measure? I think this will definitely help to move away from an exclusive and sole focus on GDP. Kiora, and thanks for your question. Namahi Nui. Namahi, Edwina, thank you. Edwina, I might put a question to you, and I'd, I'd like to ask you about the demographic changes that are sweeping through the region. Um, we know that a younger generation is expected to have much heavier bur burdens in particular. Um, it, do you think this intergenerational fairness is a, um, is a major issue in inclusion? Uh, and how can economies look at addressing it? Thank you. Uh, intergenerational fairness is a very loaded term, as is fairness. I think uh, people have to work together. So when we look at diversity, we need to move away also from the concept of ageism, because all people can contribute. And the way that they contribute has to be through humility, has to be through tacit and explicit knowledge. I think if different intergenerations um, join hands together and contribute, moving away from stereotypical roles that grandparents have to behave in a certain way, youth have to behave in a certain way, and people in between need to behave in a certain way, I think life will change and will be easier for all of us. A case in point, when we think of mentoring, we often think of mentoring as being an older person, chronologically older, mentoring a younger person. But I think it's quite useful to also think of younger people mentoring older people, younger people keeping in mind respect, and older people also keeping in mind respect for younger people. 
I think this combination or this conglomerate of healthy values and attitudes, like the story I told about the two wolves, looking at the wolf that's going to be the generous, the kind, the robust, the research-filled wolf, that's the one we need to feed. And definitely, when you look at APEC countries and the Asia-Pacific region and the growing number of millennials and youth, this is something that we need to inculcate in schools, in universities, and in organizations. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just one final question for you. Um, in the APEC region, we've seen that uh, government economic policies can help lift millions of people out of poverty, uh, but there are still ongoing challenges in ensuring that everyone benefits equally. From your perspective, what's the most important thing that, that you think governments should be thinking about to ensure that we just don't leave people behind? I think we need to have a whole of nation approach. I think in many countries, uh, people focus on a deficit model and they look primarily at pulling people up who are at the low end of the spectrum. But I think we also need to look at how can we encourage those who are at the top end of the spectrum to give back, not only through taxes, but through community service, through mentoring, through counseling, through giving jobs, through job sharing. I think that would really make such a difference because we have such a wealth of knowledge. So it is governments, but it is also individual agency. I also think that uh, organizations, universities, and individual citizens need to be able to pressurize and to nudge governments to thinking about a whole of nation approach. So when you look at indigenous people, whether you look at women, whether you look at LGBTIQ, whether you look at disability and all the other various ways of looking at diversity, I think if we join hands and if we don't work in silos, then we are going to have a much better future for all. Namihini. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edwina, for your time with us. That's, that was a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much. We've covered a lot over the last two days, and we will shortly arrive at the final session of Voices of the Future 2021, handing over the Youth Declaration to the Chair of APEC 2021, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Before we do that, though, let's take a look at what New Zealand has achieved as Chair of APEC this year. Kia ora. APEC 2021, the first one ever to be held entirely virtually. Firstly, thank you for joining us in this extraordinary year. We were thrown a challenge, but together we've all responded, and huge progress has been made from the meetings we've had. 340 and counting. Here are some highlights so far. Throughout APEC, our number one priority is recovery from COVID-19, starting with the health of our people through availability of vaccines and ensuring the health of our economies by promoting economic and trade policies that strengthen our recovery. These include measures which allow women and small businesses to thrive, promote a gradual reduction in our carbon emissions and encourage our tech and gaming firms to compete globally. APEC has always prioritised making trade easier and faster and that's never been more important for goods and the people who manufacture, ship, buy and sell them. But that's not all. From the outset, we collectively recognised that our recovery needs to be sustainable, prioritising policies that mean we can grow our economies greener and accelerating trade that benefits our environment. COVID recovery is also about inclusion, and so a significant part of our work has been to ensure the potential of groups such as women and Indigenous people is being supported and realised. And whilst we have joined together differently in APEC 2021, connecting virtually has also enabled greater flexibility. For the first time, we held an APEC informal leaders retreat with a focus firmly on our COVID response. And we've been working up an action plan to realise our collective vision for an open, dynamic, resilient and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2040. Well, everyone, as you can see, together we've achieved an extraordinary amount in an extraordinary year. 
There's plenty of work to do, but there are clear plans to achieve our goals going forward. Thank you for being part of APEC 2021 as we've joined, worked, grown together. Homie, huye, taikie. This is now time to hand over the Voices of the Future Youth Declaration to New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand. Prime Minister Ardern is going to join us from Wellington, the capital city. She is joined by New Zealand delegates Jess Jenkins, Shisla McLeod and Sophie Hanford, who will hand over the declaration. E tū ana ahau ki runga i te whenua o te iwi o te atiawa. Nā reire he mahinui ki a kuota o te haukainga. Ki a koe te whaia, te pirimia o Aotearoa, kei te mahi. Ka huri i nai nei ki te hunga ora kua tai mai, ngā mihi mai o haki a kuota. Ko te maipi tōku maunga, ko kai huata tōku awa, ko tū mapu hia arangi tōku tipuna, ko Jess Jenkins ahau. I have just acknowledged that I stand on the homeland of Te Atiawa. I give my thanks to you, Prime Minister, and to all others here today, both in this room and joining us virtually from around the APEC region. Alongside my fellow New Zealand delegates, we present before you the 2021 Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Youth Declaration. O nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa, Jess, uh, on behalf of uh, the APEC economies and as chair of APEC, it gives me great pleasure to thank you for the role that you have played alongside delegates in the preparation of this report. As chair, one of our goals has been to bring back the voice of young people as a central lead within APEC. And I believe through the work that you've done in preparing this declaration, You've created the foundation for us going forward. And no time uh, bar this one have I seen a more critical period for us to be incorporating the voice of our young people as we move forward as APEC economies. So nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Thank you for the work you and the delegates have done. This declaration was crafted by a collaboration of youth delegates from all 21 APEC economies. We have come together across cultures and backgrounds to collaborate. You are the first APEC chair in history to be actively receiving this document. And as part of the one billion young people around the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation region, we ask you to listen. Young people are facing an uncertain future. Decisions being made at APEC today will impact us for decades to come. That's why it is vital that our leaders listen to and act on the voices of the next generation. We, the Voices of the Future Delegates 2021, have been discussing the impacts of COVID-19, climate change, the digital future and inclusivity. Right now, we are at a crucial junction to face the challenges we need to build resilience and ensure equal access to vital medical resources. Improve access to education via technology. Push ahead with sustainability and develop connectivity. Ensure the well-being of our environment, society and future generations. APEC should create an emergency plan to provide financial support for its members during future pandemics and develop a common set of pandemic protocols. Digital connectivity must be improved by overcoming coverage and affordability issues. And we want tech companies to be held accountable with independent fact checkers established to combat disinformation. Greater investment in research and development will allow us to shift away from unsustainable materials such as plastics and fossil fuels. A significant shift in mindsets is needed to ensure inclusivity and opportunities for all. So targets must be set to ensure marginalised groups are prioritised with education, upskilling and development. One third of APEC region's population are young people. And we are asking that our voices be heard. And today we deliver this message to APEC leaders. Are you listening?
We now have the opportunity to hear from Prime Minister Ardern about APEC and her own experience of youth diplomacy. Prime Minister Ardern entered the New Zealand Parliament when she was 28 years old, after returning from working and living for a period overseas. She became leader of the Labour Party in 2017 and shortly afterwards Prime Minister. Then 37 years old, she was the youngest Prime Minister in New Zealand's modern history. Please welcome Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Ka whati ko te tai, ka pao te toria. As the tide recedes, we must provide opportunities to explore new paths to move forward. Thank you, Tim, and kia ora koutou katoa to Voices delegates from around the APEC region and to others following today's event online. Thank you for joining us here in New Zealand for APEC Leaders Week. And thank you all for the declaration you have worked so hard on over the last few days. Voices of the Future is one of several events which New Zealand is hosting online this week to conclude our APEC host year, and one I've been very much looking forward to. Last night, the New Zealand Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Trade hosted their counterparts from around the region for the annual APEC ministerial meeting. This Friday, I'll be hosting a meeting of APEC leaders for our annual gathering. I wish to host all of them and all of you here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, so we could show you our rolling mountains, our green pastures where, of course, the hobbits live, our sparkling seas, and to show you that we don't have quite as many sheep as you've been told. But COVID-19 keeps us all united instead in virtual ways. Regardless, I do hope you feel the warmth of our manakitanga, our hospitality, and how important you are to APEC. The global pandemic has made life difficult, but it has also opened doors. And I'm pleased to see that Voices of the Future has attracted a wide online audience, making it the largest Voices event ever. Long may that continue, and not for the sake of mere participation, but for the sake of change. For New Zealand, inclusion is one of our priorities, and this means ensuring young people also have a voice in APEC 2021. I actually had my own brief encounter as a young person in international diplomacy. My first APEC meeting was not as Prime Minister of New Zealand, but as a youth delegate to an APEC science festival in Korea. I was roughly 17 years old, I never knew as a young person living in a town of just 5,000 people in rural New Zealand that such a conference existed. And it opened my eyes to completely new cultures and experiences. Later on, as president of an international youth organisation, I saw firsthand in places like the Middle East and elsewhere why it is important for young people to have a voice on global issues. As a result, I've always believed that if young people can model change, we can and should realise it. This year, New Zealand's cheering of APEC has been driven by the unprecedented global challenge of COVID-19. APEC is responding to that challenge. We've helped to make the trade of vaccines that matter to so many people around the region much easier. We've underlined the crucial importance of free trade and keeping our markets open to one another to accelerate our economic recovery from the pandemic. And we are reaffirming the crucial importance of APEC and the role it can play in supporting a resilient recovery in the Asia Pacific region that is more inclusive, sustainable and digitally driven. Because when we're, st we're stronger, when we work together in cooperation rather than alone in isolation. This is in line with APEC's long-term agenda, contained in the Putrajaya vision which APEC leaders agreed last year and which we will elaborate on through an implementation plan this year. Many of the issues which the vision covers are part of your agenda here at Voices of the Future. In the area of digital technologies, for example, we must find ways to ensure the opportunities are shared widely and benefit society as a whole. We must also respond decisively to the ongoing and worsening crisis that is climate change. 
We want APEC to play an effective role here by promoting measures like an end to government subsidies for fossil fuels that can help us reach sustainability goals. And we also need to ensure that the recovery benefits all. The place of Māori in New Zealand means that policies to promote the economic inclusion of Indigenous peoples have been a particular focus for us this year as Chair of APEC. The declaration you have provided me today shows that these are all big issues that matter to you too. I want to acknowledge here that COVID has also had a significant impact on young people in terms of education, employment and mental health and well-being. Here in New Zealand, we have taken initiatives and steps to ensure that rangatahi or young people have a say in decisions about recovery and take leadership roles and are able to drive transformative change. For example, each year the government funds youth engagement campaigns across a range of digital media channels so our young people can have proper conversations with decision makers about the issues that matter to them, such as climate change. Youth Declaration also underlines the importance to young people around the region of being involved in decisions that affect them. Ultimately, policies that APEC members adopt matter. APEC members make up 37% of the world's population, almost half of its trade, and around 60% of its GDP. It is a place where our region works together for a better, more cooperative future for our people in the region. That makes it important that our discussions at APEC involve everyone, especially young people. You've reminded me, reminded us all, that we must always look forward and make decisions not with the next generation in mind, but with the next generation at the centre. Because what generation has a greater stake in the decisions of today than the generation of tomorrow? Indeed, yours. So thank you for ensuring your voices are heard with the declaration you've handed to me today. I will read it with enthusiasm, knowing that it is the voice of young people from right around the APEC region, and that as such, it will be diverse, inclusive, insightful and creative. I will also encourage other APEC leaders to be responsive to the interests and concerns of young people throughout our region. I'm sure that they'll be interested to read this declaration too. And can I finish with a personal commitment? We are listening. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, and thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for your address. It's now my pleasure to hand over to some of our Voices of the Future delegates for questions. And I can let you know that we have questions coming from Papua New Guinea, Mexico, Singapore and the United States. So first to Papua New Guinea. My name is Samuel Tabe and I'm the lead educator for the Papua New Guinea delegation. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous landowners of Fort Mosby, the Motukotabu people from which I speak. Secondly, it is an honor and a privilege to be in this session with you, Prime Minister. Um, I have two parts to this question. Uh, the first part is, you introduced the world's first well-being budget last year, focusing on mental illness, child poverty, and family violence. New Zealand is the first Western country to design its entire budget around well-being priorities and instructed its ministries to design policies for the well-being of its citizens. Can you please share with us the voices of the future? What drove this initiative? And if the outcomes are tracking to your expectations? And in regards to this year's four themes, what are the accountability measures the APEC leaders will take to track the expected outcomes of what is declared this year? And as chair of this year's APEC summit, what will you encourage the youth to do to ensure implementation? Thank you. Kia ora, Samuel, and thank you for your question. If I can start with your second question first. I hope that what you've seen from uh, New Zealand during our role as chair is a desire to elevate once again uh, the voices of our young people within the APEC process. And I hope that that is a legacy that we leave. I hope from here on uh, that we uh, have started now a practice of a formal handover 
uh, so that the chair of APEC receives the voices of the future. And perhaps what I wouldn't mind seeing in the future is the ability to report against uh, what has been achieved on an annual basis against uh, the prior uh, year's youth declaration as a way to continue a reporting cycle of sorts within that APEC process. I hope that means that we can, in real time, make sure that we are demonstrating those accountabilities to young people who are engaging in the APEC process and continue to drive more engagement between our APEC leaders uh, and the representatives from their own nations as well. So let's see if we can bed that as a practice from here on. To answer your first question about our wellbeing budget, you know, when I came into politics, it occurred to me that on the international stage, there seems to be a, a small handful of measures that we tend to rank or prioritise as demonstrating whether or not a, a country or a nation is successful. And uh, growth seems to be one of them. But measures of things like GDP do not really drill down and tell you the true story of whether or not a country, its people and its environment are thriving. It was once said by an American politician that GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. And it's true. Now, we had a period in New Zealand where our growth, uh, you know, looked, as some would have described, uh, as if we were a rock star economy. And yet at that same time, we had environmental degradation, which was leaving a legacy for the next generation that would put them uh, into environmental indebtedness. And we had a growing mental health crisis. So what we've tried to design is a way of making in future investment decisions which prioritise not just how well our economy is performing, but how well our environment and the well-being of our people are performing as well. So we drive our investment decisions based on that, but I hope in future you'll also see a greater analysis of our success against those measures as well. How are we going? Well, there's more, more work to do. I don't think there'll ever be a time where I'll stand up here and say, job done. But we have at least seen a, a reorientation of those long-term investment decisions that are all designed to, I hope, uh, change the future outcomes of the well-being of our people and environment. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister and Papua New Guinea for your question. Uh, can we now cross to uh, the delegation from Mexico for your question? Thank you very much. Um, greetings, uh, Prime Minister, and it is an honor to be able to uh, speak with you right now. So my question is, uh, with the recent COP26 meeting, as well as with uh, the Voices of the Future meeting, we both worked uh, in the pursuit of a greener future, and there were different topics that, uh, like the uh, reversing deforestation or uh, cutting methane emissions. Uh, however, scientists led by the IPCC have often criticized the lack of ambition. Sources, there are still trillions in subsidies to fossil fuels. Not only that, but there are, there are countries uh, which their economies are highly dependent on fossil fuels. And I guess the question is, uh, is the world ready to take a bold action towards climate future? And if so, how can countries be held accountable for not complying in the international arena? Mm. Now, my answer would be, if the world is not ready to take bold action, then the world must be ready for uh, the disastrous results of climate change. So those are the two choices that we have. Uh, and, you know, for us as APEC chair, uh, we have been driving very, very hard towards making those investment decisions that ensure that we don't see the catastrophe that results from investment in fossil fuels and unsustainable uh, um, activity so that instead we can start seeing that investment reorientate uh, towards green technology and those areas where we can future-proof our economies. So a big uh, and one of the larger ambitions that we set as APEC chair was action on fossil fuel subsidies. Now it's actually been a commitment that APEC economies have made over a number of years and at this point what we've been able to seek from APEC economies is uh, a commitment to not see the ongoing growth in investment in this area because that has been one of the problems that we've faced. That's 500 billion US dollars going into fossil fuel subsidies 
that could make an enormous difference if instead invested in technology that are designed around climate change mitigation and adaptation. So that's been our focus and our goal. Do we need to be more ambitious than this? Absolutely. Uh, we would like to see, of course, a world where there is no fossil fuel subsidies uh, within our economies. And that's long been a position of New Zealand, which we will continue to advocate through fora such as uh, the World Trade Organization 12th Ministerial Meeting, which we'll be doing very shortly. Uh, on terms of accountability, I speak now as a politician rather than as APEC chair, if I may. I'm not sure if I'm allowed that liberty, but if I may. I think we often seek uh, uh, tools and institutions to drive accountability. And yes, there's no doubt that events like COP26 uh, definitely make a difference towards orientating the world's eyes towards uh, world leaders and holding them to account on their individual action. But I wouldn't for a moment want to diminish the incredible impact that country by country young people are having on the decision making of leaders in this moment in time. Uh, I think we often have a view that it's only influence, money, or voting, those are the three tools that somehow influence the decisions that are made in this environment. It is not so. You are powerful. Uh, I can give countless examples where young people, regardless of their age, have influenced me and my cabinet in our decision making, be it through letter campaigns, petitions, activity, peaceful protest. You have continually brought to the fore for world leaders the importance of climate action because it affects you so directly. So, so don't for a moment diminish, I think, the power of the accountability that you yourself bring to us. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mexico. Uh, can I now ask uh, Singapore for you to put your question to the Prime Minister? Greetings, Prime Minister. Thank you for gracing us with your presence at Voices of the Future today. I am Danraj representing the Singaporean delegation. Our question is, you previously mentioned the importance of empathy and kindness in leadership. How do you continue to foster these connections as everything becomes increasingly digital? Thank you. So really, it's a really good question. Well, I guess to, at one level, I'd say that regardless of the forum, you know, we may um, be separated uh, by quite some distance now, but in every other way, despite the lack of physical proximity, I hope that you can still get a, a sense of, uh, we can get a sense of one another and our ambition, our motivations, uh, and the kind of leadership we wish to demonstrate through our words and our actions, despite distance. Words and actions as leaders matter. And one of the things that I have been very determined that we as a nation here in our corner of the world um, demonstrate is that we increasingly live in an environment where our geographic boundaries don't matter anymore. Where what we say, no matter the platform or where or how, uh, those words have a flow-on effect beyond our borders. And so we increasingly need to be mindful of that impact in a, global, in a globalized environment. So then if we take that into a digital context, uh, there uh, I also think as leaders we need to demonstrate that we will push for uh, that kindness, that empathy, those safe spaces, in an increasingly digital world and digital environments. We often, some of the, for instance, regulatory tools that we've used to deal with things and challenges like hate speech and so on, are much harder to deal with in a, in a digital and online environment. And that's where we have a leadership role to play, working alongside those, um, for instance, tech companies, social media platforms, providers, who are providing the environment for us to gauge, engage digitally and set out expectations that, yes, it's accessible, we have a free and open internet, um, that we can actually overcome so many barriers through those environments, but that we maintain both free speech and a set of standards that ensure that we don't alienate um, and uh, diminish the voices of others as well. It's a very hard space we're all as world leaders trying to traverse. Think if you approach it with a set of values-based principles, there is a way through, and it's a piece of work that we've been trying to champion as a nation, 
not necessarily out of choice, but out of necessity because of what we experienced a few years ago through a horrific act of, of violence in New Zealand. Our legacy and our hope is that we can change those digital online environments to be a place that is open, accessible and kind. Thank you uh, very much, Singapore. Uh, can I now ask uh, the United States delegation to put forward their question? Hello and good evening, Prime Minister. It's a great honor to be able to speak with you. Uh, I am Grace Kirby, and I am one of the four delegates representing the United States of America. And on behalf of my delegation, I would like to ask, what lessons can the people of the Asia Pacific region learn from New Zealand's indigenous rights policies? Well, kia ora, Grace, and thank you for the question. I think the first thing I would, I would say is that uh, New Zealand, whilst always willing to share our experience, will always acknowledge that for every, nat uh, for every nation, there will be uh, a differing history, uh, differing cultural context, differing issues for Indigenous peoples. And so we would, of course, always be very mindful that our experience in Aotearoa, New Zealand, will not necessarily ev ever replicate uh, any experience anywhere else, and nor would we pretend that it could. I think the second point, context we would provide, is that we are not perfect. Uh, we have come on a long journey as a young nation uh, where the foundation of our journey actually in itself is unique, but has been uh, a guiding star for us. And that is the fact that in New Zealand, we have a document in Te Tiriti o Waitangi that guides the nature of our partnership between the Crown and indigenous, uh, the Indigenous peoples of New Zealand. But even then, it is a living document for us. And I think if there were one lesson that I would share is just the willingness to continue to learn uh, and we only learn through uh, an engagement that we would say here, kanohi e te kanohi, face to face, and constant dialogue with one another. Uh, that would be, I think, the most important principle that I would share from New Zealand's perspective. One final word. Uh, how do we ensure, though, that when we're having that engagement and that constant dialogue based on that living um, document that we have in New Zealand, uh, the importance of shared understanding through language cannot be underestimated. I unfortunately am of a generation in New Zealand that did not, by, uh, by um, uh, practice, uh, learn uh, the language of Māori, te reo Māori, in uh, a schooling context. Our goal is to change that for future generations. We'd like one million uh, New Zealanders to be able to take up conversation in Te Reo Māori uh, in the coming decades so that we then start to build a shared understanding of our history and, of course, the culture of uh, the Indigenous peoples of New Zealand. And by, through language, uh, my strong belief is that that provides a foundation for understanding. Uh, it is an official language of New Zealand, and I hope, therefore, becomes a language that my child in the future will be able to converse in. Thank you very much uh, to the United States and Prime Minister for your answer to that question. Just before we conclude today, I wondered if I could uh, put one question to you, which is to ask, um, New as New Zealand is about to hand over our, our hosting year of APEC, I wonder if you, as chair of, of APEC this year, could look back over the year and perhaps tell us uh, one of your personal highlights um, of the past 12 months? Well, I can tell you it's some lowlights to start with, and, and um, that would include having to make the decision about the nature in which we, want, we would be able to hold this meeting. And it was an incredibly difficult decision. Uh, but from that uh, challenge and trial actually produced one of my highlights. My hope is that from our time as APEC chair, not only have we been able, I hope, to drive a future agenda, which reflects, as far as I can tell from my read of the Youth Declaration today, reflects the hopes and aspirations of young people going forward into our ongoing implementation plan. Not only have I hoped that we've done that, I hope that we've also innovated. And I hope that innovation 
carries forward into the future for, uh, for APEC. The fact that in the middle of a pandemic, what could be more important than using the heft of the APEC economies and leaders to remove barriers to accessing, for instance, vaccines? And so bringing in uh, an, a meeting into the middle of the APEC hosting year, which hadn't been done before, but because we were in the mindset of a virtual hosting year, made it possible. And I hope that in the future we're willing to continue to innovate in that way and ensure that distance doesn't divide or indeed an annual cycle doesn't remove our ability to engage more frequently with one another in a world where we owe it to each other to keep pushing uh, consistently for the change that I can see young people are asking of us. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. And I think just the fact that we've been able to have all of these member economies with us throughout Voices of the Future and, and speak uh, directly with you uh, speaks to that digital innovation uh, uh, that you, you spoke of. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time with us today and for accepting the declaration from our Voices of the Future delegates. As you know, young people are the biggest stakeholders in the work that APEC is doing this year to chart a way out of the pandemic and towards a smarter, greener and more inclusive future. I know that you have a very, very busy week ahead, so we really do appreciate your time with us and thank you uh, for being here today. Nā mihi nui ki koutou katoa. Ka kite. Ka kite. Now, to all of our delegates, this brings us to the end of the APEC Voices of the Future 2021 programme. We hope that you have enjoyed this first ever virtual Voices of the Future. And while, as the Prime Minister said, the pandemic has prevented us meeting in person this year, our discussions have highlighted the importance of the issues on our agenda, international cooperation to overcome the pandemic, and the shape of the post-pandemic world in relation to technology, the environment, and social inclusion. I hope that you have all gained new understanding from this event and learned from the perspectives of others and made some great connections. I'm sure that when travel is a little bit easier, many of you will meet face to face and remain connected for years to come. In closing, the organisers of the event, the APEC New Zealand Voices Trust, Auckland University of Technology and APEC New Zealand would like to thank all of you, the delegates uh, and the Voices affiliates around the region for their support in making this event happen. Thank you all very much. Matewa. I'd like to thank all of those involved in APEC 2021 Voices of the Future. It has been truly memorable. The passion and effort in making this declaration has been outstanding and it has been a pleasure working with you all. We would also like to wish Tyler and Youth delegates the best for their hosting year in 2022. As a final closing of the Voices of the Future event, I would like to invite everyone to join me in giving each other a final wave goodbye.
Tu vas te ir en hasta que tu rangi. 